Greetings, brethren. This is a special message entitled, True Fellowship with God. And what does that mean? Now, it's important for us to realize that God's plan goes way back and that God has planned this for who knows how long. And we're a part of it because we have God's Spirit, because of what Jesus Christ has done, and because what God is doing with us. So let's come to 2 Timothy, the first chapter, and let's pick it up beginning in verse 7. And we're going to see some things here, though we've covered it before, and many of just about all of the scriptures that we have covered we have read before. But there is something about the Word of God and the Spirit of God and understanding things that we grow in grace and knowledge and we grow in understanding even when we go back and restudy and restudy and restudy the Word of God. So verse 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of sound-mindedness. Now, that's the overall goal, because you see, conversion is in the mind. And we still, all of us, have a long way to go with that, as we'll see in a little bit. Verse 8, Therefore, you should not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but jointly suffer with me for the sake of the gospel according to the power of God. Now, this is how we are to approach difficulties and trials that come, because they will come. Now, notice verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. A holy calling. See, what God is doing is not like the Protestants have, where if you go to church, you're just fine. God wants fellowship with you, as we will see. Not according to our own works, but according to his own purpose and grace. Now think of that. Remember John 6, 44. The Father draws us to Christ, and Christ draws us to the Father. That's a tremendous thing. You need to understand that God the Father himself and Jesus Christ himself that we will see a little later are directly involved spiritually in our lives. Continuing which was given us in Christ Jesus before the ages of time. Now contemplate that. That's a tremendous thing and an awesome thing to understand. And yet God is dealing with each one of us individually because of his love and because of his truth and because of his purpose and his plan. Verse 10, which has now been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has annulled death. Now, a little sidebar on annulled. When something is annulled, it is as if it never happened. Now you understand why. Those who went to the persecution and execution and slaughter for believing in Jesus Christ, did it with joy, because death will be annulled and has brought to light eternal life and incorruptibility through the gospel. Now, that's something really important to understand and to really realize. Now, let's see what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly things. Now the blessings are this, to know God, to know Jesus Christ, to understand the Word of God, which is a spiritual blessing, to look forward to eternal life, and all of the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm at the resurrection, that is going to be astounding indeed. Now, verse 4. I want you to think about this, and especially if you've been going through a trial or difficulty and problem, and you feel discouraged, and you think everyone's against you, and you don't even know about God. Well, I want you to understand what God says about your calling. Verse 4. According as he has personally chosen us for himself. Now then, God had his plan and purpose before the ages of time. And God does the calling, and God does the choosing, and those who answer the call are chosen. And when we get down to the very last, there's the world and Satan and all that is out there and the called and the chosen and the faithful. And that's us, brethren. Chosen us for himself. He's our father. We will become the sons and daughters of God. That's an amazing thing to contemplate. So I want you to really think and understand and with God's Spirit to grasp the meaning of what we are going to cover today. Before the foundation of the world, in order that we might be holy and blameless before Him in love, in His plan. See, you have to put this together. Has predestinated us for sonship to Himself, through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his own will. Now, this is why we need to really stop and think about this, especially with the Passover and unleavened bread and Pentecost coming up here very quickly. To the praise of the glory of his grace, because it's by grace we have been saved and not ourselves wherein he has made us objects of his grace in the beloved Son, and that's Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption, were purchased back from the devil by the price that Christ paid. Through his blood, even the remission of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he has made to abound toward us in all wisdom, and intelligence, having made known to us. Now think about this for a minute. What is it that you know about the plan of God? And we understand that's revealed by his Sabbath, Passover, and holy days. His plan, not only for us, but all of mankind, because all human beings have been made in the, the image and likeness of God. And so the Bible tells us so that we will be after the family of God, the God kind. That's why we're here. That's why we're doing what we're doing, you see. Made known to us the mystery of his own will according to his good pleasure, which he proposed in himself before the ages of time that in the divine plan for the fulfilling of the times, he might bring all things together in Christ, both the things in the heavens and the things upon the earth. Reconcile it all to God in his marvelous and beautiful plan. Verse 11, yes, in him, in whom we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestinated according to his purpose, who is working out all things according to the counsel of his own will, that we 
might be the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. How does God do this? Well, the next verse tells us, in whom we also trusted after hearing the word of truth. And remember this, it's always the truth of God, the truth of God, the truth of God, and the love of God, and the love of God, and the love of God, and our love back to God. Word of truth, the gospel of your salvation in whom also, after hearing, you were sealed with the spirit of promise. Now, we all have received the Holy Spirit. Now, many times we wonder how that works. Well, let's compare it to a cell phone or a computer. It works. How does it work? There are microwaves which carry everything on it and bring it to your phone so you can see it and you can hear it and you can record it and you can keep it. But did you ever see any of the microwaves? No. Did you ever feel any of the microwaves? No. Well, that's much like how the Holy Spirit of God works in our mind. And we have been sealed for the day of resurrection by his Holy Spirit, see, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. That is awesome indeed to contemplate. Now, you tie those things together. Now, let's come back to the epistle of 1 John. And this tells us in the first chapter something tremendous that God wants us to have with him. And this comes with prayer and with study and with living God's way, having our trials and difficulties come upon us, and these things that are all part of living in this world, and we'll see how we overcome it. But again, I want you to understand that God's plan goes way back, as Paul wrote, before the ages of time. Now, in 1 John, the first chapter, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our own eyes, that which we observe for ourselves and our own hands handled concerning the word of life. He's talking about everything to do with how they were taught by Jesus, lived with him almost day and night for over three years to be the called apostles. And John was the apostle that Jesus loved. And it's interesting. John writes more about the love of God and our love to him than any of the other apostles. Verse 2. And the life was manifested, and we have seen, and are bearing witness, and are reporting to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. And remember, Peter, James, and John went with Jesus to the Mount of Transfiguration and saw the vision of what it was like to be a spirit being. And they always remembered this. And this is what he's referring to here. Now notice what he says in verse 3. That which we have seen and have heard were reporting to you. And they wrote it down. And we are going to see that John had the blessing of writing down some of the very words of Christ that none of the other apostles were able to write down which are directly related to our calling and what God is doing. In order that you also may have fellowship with us, and this is the key, for the fellowship, and that's what it is in the Greek. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his own Son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's a tremendous thing to understand. And this fellowship is a spiritual fellowship, 
which is through prayer, through study, through meditation, through living God's way, and everything connected with what we are doing. Then he says, These things we're also writing to you that your joy may be completely full, a joy that gives you peace of mind regardless of the circumstances. Now, it's not a joy that you're jumping up and down and all this sort of thing, but it is peace and joy. And remember, that's what Paul wrote in the introduction of every single one of his epistles, peace and love and grace from God the Father and Jesus Christ. Verse 5, and this is the message that we have heard from him and are declaring to you that God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. If we proclaim we have fellowship with him, but are walking in darkness, we are lying to ourselves. Now, darkness is the way of the world, the way of Satan the devil, the way of manipulating the scriptures, falsifying what it says, telling lies that are absolutely untrue, yet are promulgated in fake Christianity. We are lying to ourselves, and we are not practicing the truth. Now, notice, practicing, that means living by, thinking by, having our minds reoriented and converted this way, okay? Practicing the truth. We'll see a little later, Jesus said, your word is the truth. And sanctify us through your truth. Now, sanctify means to make holy. And that's why we are called holy brethren. But what happens? We're still carnal. We still have things to overcome. Though we've been delivered from the law of sin and death, God has not yet removed it from us. So what do we do? And remember, conversion is here in the mind. And there's still a lot of things in our minds that we have to get out. And also, everything that we have ever done in our whole life is recorded somewhere in our minds. And that's why, at the resurrection, all of the things of the flesh will be gone. But we have to get there. Let's read on. However, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ and each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his own son, cleanses us from all sin because the cleansing of the sin we're going to see is a day-by-day-by-day-by-day day day thing. If we say we do not have sin, we're deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, just like Jesus said in the model prayer, forgive us our sins and our debts, as we forgive those who sin against us and are indebted to us. If we confess our sins, how do we confess our sins? That is called repentance. Now, notice what happens when we do. He is faithful. That means he always will and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, that's quite a thing to really understand, okay? Now, hold your place here, and let's come to 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. Now, how are we going to accomplish this? See, because living the way of God is called the way of God, and we walk in the way of God, the way of the Lord, the way of Jesus Christ, the way of God the Father. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. For although we walk in the flesh, yeah, we're still human beings. We do not war according to the flesh. We have a warfare. 
We have a fight. We have to resist. We have to overcome. That's what that means. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the overthrowing of strongholds. It is spiritual. That's why right where we first began in 2 Timothy, the first chapter, we are to stir up the spirit that is in us. Because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and sound-mindedness. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the overthrowing of strongholds. What are those strongholds? They're all mental. They're all right here. Now, we're not out here sinning, breaking the Ten Commandments in an observable way, but overcoming the lust and the law of sin and death that is within. This is the conversion that is ongoing, and here's how we do it. Casting down vain imaginations, and that we cast it down, that means we get rid of it, we repent of it, we ask God for forgiveness, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and that's anything that goes against the way of God, the truth of God, the Word of God in the Bible. That's why we have it. And today we have a particularly harder time with it because we have, with all of the high-tech things that we use and the television that we watch and our smartphones that we use, we have these things bombarding us all the time. You can't even drive down any highway and not see a billboard that has some sort of sinful, lustful thing on it to try and sell something or get you to do something. Now, here's what we are to do. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's why we have the Spirit of God. We can overcome it. It can be cleansed. And having a readiness to avenge all disobedience. Now, those are disobedient thoughts. Whenever your obedience has been fulfilled, in other words, that you do it God's way to overcome it. Let's see how this is explained in Ephesians 5. Now, this is why we have the Passover every year. This is why we have the Feast of Unleavened Bread every year. This is why we look at our lives and see that we have a lot to overcome and we need to get rid of it. But it's only gotten rid of by the power of God's Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5, verse 25, that Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it so that he might sanctify it, that is, make it holy, having cleansed it. And that's what it is when we bring every thought into captivity to Christ that is cleansing our minds. And that is a daily thing that we need to do. Cleansed it with the washing of the water by the word. Now, this tells us this. God's Holy Spirit is like an unto water. That's what Jesus said there in John 7, that the one who is converted out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And he spoke of the Holy Spirit in that regard. That he might present it to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it might be holy and without blame. So that's the whole process of conversion. And this is what God has designed for us. So don't be discouraged when you're fighting things in your mind that you need to overcome. Get on your knees, ask God to forgive you, cleanse your mind, do Bible study, study on the topic, whatever it may be, go through the Psalms, go through the Proverbs, 
whatever part of the Bible you need. That's why in that process, that cleansing, that purifying comes from Christ with his spirit as part of the new covenant because he said that he would write his laws and his commandments, and that means the word of God, into our hearts and inscribe them in our minds. Now, let's come back here to 1 John, the second chapter, and let's see how to deal with this sin. We've already covered a good measure of it. Now, here is how we get rid of it spiritually. 1 John 2 and verse 1, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. He didn't say do not, may not. Yet if anyone does sin, what should we do? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. That means the atoning. That means the forgiving. That means the redemption for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, Understand this, every word of God that has been written down, which is the truth, is for all people to know God, to know Christ, but especially for those who have been called and chosen and faithful to grow in grace and to grow in knowledge and to grow in the love of God. Verse 3, by this standard, we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Isn't that something? That we know God, we know God the Father, we know Jesus Christ, we know the Word of God, and how do we know the Word of God? If we study it, if we live by it, if we keep his commandments, if we apply it to ourselves, there are a lot of fake ones out there. Verse 4, the one who says, I know him, does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. On the other hand, if anyone is keeping his word, now notice that encompasses the whole Bible, and today we have the whole Bible. That's an amazing thing to understand, brethren. Truly, in this one, the love of God is being perfected. It is a process. By this means, we know that we are in him. Now over here, 1 John chapter 4, in verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this way, the love of God was manifested toward us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we might live through him. And this act is the love the greatest love of all. Not that we love God, rather that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also are duty-bound to love one another. Now, let's see how we are to love God. All the world wants God's love to them but they are not willing to love God back. So let's come to the book of Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. Here's what Jesus said, the first of all the commandments. Hear, O Israel, so you put your name there. Our one God is the Lord, the Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now circle that. All your heart. Not part, not some, not most, but all. And with all your soul, that means your whole being. And with all your mind. And we've seen how to overcome the sin within through the spirit and power of God by the washing of the water of the word. And with all your strength, this is the first commandment. Then he says, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, let's come to the Gospel of John, chapter 13. Now, in John 13, Jesus gave the example of foot washing. 
And he said, I've given you example that you are duty bound to do, to wash one another's feet. Then he said, Truly, truly, I tell you, a servant is not greater than his Lord, nor a messenger greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Then after Judas Iscariot left, he gave a hint of what was going to happen. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. Think about that. The bloody crucifixion and scourging he was going through was going to glorify God. That's an amazing thing to understand. If God has been glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall immediately glorify him. That's true, because he raised him from the dead. Little children, I'm with you yet a little while. You shall seek me, but as I told the Jews where I'm going, you cannot come. I'm telling you also. Then he gave a new commandment. And this is what is important for us as brethren intermingling with each other. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another in the same way that I have loved you. This is how you are to love one another. And by this shall everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now let's come to John 14. Now we go through this every year at the Passover. We study it during the year. We read it. It's part of us. But these next things that we're going to read are those things which you learn more of and experience more of with God's Spirit as you read it and think about it and understand what Jesus said. So what I want you to do is this. Since this is the Word of God and the Word of God directly spoken by Jesus, and this is not written anywhere else in the Bible because God gave this to John who wrote more about love and was the disciple that Jesus loved so that he could convey these things to us. But here we're going to learn the example of Christ. Verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now he knew what he was going to go through. And he knew what was going to happen to the disciples. That they would all be scattered after he was arrested and taken off. Now notice that Jesus has his mind on the overall goal. The goal of the completion of God's plan. And this is how we keep our compass. This is how we know that we can stay the course. Jesus gave us the example in this promise, verse 2. In my Father's house. Now, where's the Father's house? New Jerusalem are many dwelling places. If it were otherwise, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, so that where I am, you may be also. Now that's something. Think about that. Being with Jesus Christ and God the Father. So this is how we go through our trial. We keep our mind on the goal, and the goal is New Jerusalem. He said, where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas said, well, we don't know where you're going, and we don't know the way. Now notice verse 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Then Jesus said, If you had known me, you would have known my Father, but from this time forward you know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient. 
And Jesus said, Have I been with so long a time, and you have not known me? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. Why do you say, Show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and Father in me? The words that I'm speaking to you, I do not speak from my own self, but the Father himself who dwells in me does the works. And that's how we overcome, because we'll see that God the Father gives his Spirit to us. Let's come down here to verse 14. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Condition is on us. Verse 15, if you love me, keep the commandments, namely my commandments. Now that's something. Now notice what Jesus is telling them, that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit. And I will ask the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that it will be with you throughout the age, even the spirit of the truth. So what's working in our minds to expose these sins that are still there? The truth of the Spirit of God. The truth of the Word of God, so that we can repent and get rid of it. Even the spirit of the truth which the world cannot receive because it perceives it not. But you know it because it dwells with you and shall be within you. Within us, we have that. Come here to verse 21. The one who has my commandments and is keeping them. What a phrase that is, isn't it? That is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me shall be loved by my Father and you have fellowship with him. And I will love him, will manifest myself to him. That's a spiritual manifestation started with the calling of the Father to draw us. So Judas didn't understand it, but Jesus gave this answer in verse 23. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That's his whole message there. And my Father will love him, and we, that is, the Father in Christ, will come to him and make our abode or dwelling place with him. Now, that's quite a promise. The one who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine but the Father's. Now, let's come to chapter 15, verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. He takes away every branch in me that does not bear fruit. And we are to bear fruit. And he cleanses each one that bears fruit in order that it may bear more fruit. That's why we have trials. That's why we have difficulties. You are already clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Now notice this. Verse 4, dwell in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, but only if it remains in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you are dwelling in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. The one who is dwelling in me and I in him bears much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not dwell in me, is cast out as a branch and dried up. If you dwell in me, now pay attention to this carefully, and my words dwell in you, that is, are living in you in your mind. You shall ask whatever you desire, and it shall come to pass for you. In this is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit so shall you be my disciples. Now notice the next couple of verses. These are so important for us to realize and understand. As the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Live in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall live in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and live in his love. 
That's quite a thing. Now, verse 11. These things I spoke unto you in order that my joy may dwell in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Then he explained that he's going to lay down his life and he calls them friends, no longer servants. Then he says, verse 16, You yourselves did not choose me, but I have personally chosen you. Now that ties in with Ephesians, the first chapter, God the Father and Jesus Christ together, and ordained you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain so that whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he may give you. These things I command you that you love one another. There are things in chapter 16 where Christ tells us to pray directly to the Father. That's correct. And that he has overcome the world and that in the world we'll have tribulation. But in him we have peace. Now chapter 17 and verse 1. Now I don't know how John got these words. Because when Peter, James, and John went with him in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was praying before he was arrested, and he was praying so that great drops of sweat with blood were dropping down, he was so intense in it, and they were over there sleeping. So these are words that Jesus gave to John, especially to write. This John 17 is one of the most marvelous parts of the Bible for us. Verse 1, Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come right down to the hour. Glorify your own son so that your son may also glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh in order that you may give eternal life to all whom you have given him, for this is eternal life, that they may know you. Jesus was God manifested in the flesh, but with human flesh, he was not true God. And Jesus Christ, whom you did send, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you gave to me to do. That is the preaching, teaching of the disciples. Now notice verse 5. Now this goes back to where we started in 2 Timothy, the first chapter. And now, Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. That's a tremendous thing. Verse 11, he says, And I'm no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, those you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. Notice Jesus always kept his mind on the goal. And that's what we need to do. But now I'm coming to you in these things I'm speaking while yet in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in them. Then notice what he is saying to the Father, that he has finished what he has done here. I have given them your words, and the world has hated them because they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. I do not pray that you would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth, that is, make them holy. And what we have covered today with the fellowship between us and God the Father and Jesus Christ, that is making us holy. Your word is the truth. Now notice verse 18, because here's a personal prayer by Jesus for you before 
you even existed. And for all the saints down through all time, even as you did send me into the world, I also have sent them into the world, and for their sakes I sanctify myself so that they may be sanctified in your truth. I do not pray for these only, but also for those who shall believe in me through their word. That is a prayer to each and every one that God is called from that time forth clear to the return of Jesus Christ. A personal prayer for you by Jesus Christ to the Father that they all may be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Well, that's quite a statement, isn't it? That's what God wants. You be in the family of God, the sons and daughters of God, those who are going to bring peace to this world during the millennium, that they may also be one in us. Think about that, to be one with God the Father and Jesus Christ, all the saints together, being in New Jerusalem, living there, doing the will of God, that is awesome indeed, and this is what he's praying about here. And I have given them the glory that you gave to me in order that they may be one in the same way that we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected into one, that the world may know that you did send me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those whom you have given me may also be with me where I am, so that they may behold my glory. Now, what is that going to be like? What kind of glory does Jesus have? Which you have given me, because you did love me before the foundation of the world. Before the ages of time. Righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you did send me, and I have made known your name to them and will make it known, so that the love wherewith you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's the whole thing, see? That's how we have fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. That's how we overcome the sin within. This is how we are inspired to understand that the plan of God and our calling and all of these things are going to be fulfilled. Now let's come to Ephesians, the third chapter, and let's see Paul's prayer very similar to this one. Ephesians 3, verse 9, And that I might enlighten all as to what is the fellowship of this mystery. And think about what Paul has written, that all the brethren, down through time, with the word of God had this, fellowship of the mystery that has been hidden from the ages in God who created all things by Jesus Christ so that in the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the principalities and powers in high places. Even they are awed at what is God doing with human beings. How can you take us in a condition that we are and make us holy? That's a mystery to them. According to his eternal purpose. Notice how Paul always goes back to the purpose of God which he has wrought in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and direct access with confidence through his very own faith. And that's through prayer, that's through study, and that's through living. So then I beseech you to the brethren, do not fade in my tribulations which are for you, which are working for your glory. For this cause I bow my knees 
to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Brethren, we are part of such a great and marvelous and wonderful thing. That's why everything we go through is worth every bit of it. Everything that we struggle with, all the joys, all the wonderful things that God blesses us with, understanding of his truth, see? Now notice that he may grant you, given to you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power by his spirit in the inner man, in the mind that we have to overcome the law of sin and death within us, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, every one of us, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all of the saints the whole plan of God. And brethren, those of us who are living in the end times have the capacity and the time and the Word of God and the things that we have to comprehend with all the saints. Now notice, and this goes on into the resurrection and beyond, what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which passes human knowledge. This is the goal. This is the purpose. This is why you were called so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. There can be nothing greater than what God has promised to us. That, that fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ help us understand this and realize this and to really go forth in the way that God wants us to. Now notice, this is a guarantee that it will happen. Now to him who is able, that is, has the power to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that is working in us. To him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all generations, even into the ages of eternity. Amen. Brethren, this is the great fellowship that we have with God the Father and Jesus Christ. And may this help you and inspire you and draw you closer to God the Father and Jesus Christ in every way.